Most people, when they're looking at technological adoption curves, I think they get confused at associating Bitcoin with purely a you know a, a growth cycle, an adoption cycle like you know cell phones, like mobile phones, like the internet. I don't see it that way personally. My view is that you've got not only does it have to cross the chasm of the adoption by convincing people this is better money and it's better technology, it also has to cross the chasm of politics, right? And it will. My big quick point I like to emphasize: this will happen. It's only a matter of time. But what I will tell you is that you know politics moves a little bit slower, and there are institutional hurdles in place. There are regulatory hurdles, legal challenges that come, and that can push back against what I think is the tsunami coming in the way of Bitcoin and larger adoption of the asset. I think that's really important, and the reason why I think it's important is because I think when you're looking at technologies like Bitcoin, you have to realize. Mr. Joe Calasari, thank you so much for joining me today and being a playable character, being someone who can critically think in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir, for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. Excited to talk with everybody. There's so much going on, and uh, I feel like we uh, we need to make every second count. That is that is true. As we are just talking offline here, you're the perfect person for what's going on in the world right now. So I'd love to, I mean, just kind of let you go. I would love for you to just kind of you know spill your thoughts on what you think is going on here in the in the world. The attacks on self custody, the seeming reversals. You know, Bitcoiners crypto world getting attacked now it's just 180 all of a sudden overnight trump's getting convicted where from from joe calasari's perspective where where are we in the world right now well i think we're at a point where we're heading towards a lot of um increasingly uh, well a very increasingly volatile fall right i think there's a lot of uh, in stake with this election both from the economic standpoint from the regulatory standpoint i mean it's a battle for the white house right and battle for the for the senate and congress so I think from a lot of respects, uh, you have people focused on um, the very narrow segment of base that can be animated by cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, et cetera. And I think that's drawing a lot of people out. I don't think there's a lot of undecided voters left in the United States, at least. Yeah. I think people are pretty much made up. So in those types of battles, right, you have to get your base to the polls. And the way you do that is with hot button issues. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier, and I, and I come from a background working in politics, so I'll, I'll just tell you that uh, it's it's one of those things where everybody has their niche issue, their thing they care about most. Um, this friend of mine who's making the argument that like, you know, at any given time, really the entire electorate can be boiled down to single issue voters. There's a ton of single issue voters, right. whether it's on issues like abortion, whether it's on something like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, whether it's on something like inflation, everybody has their one niche issue. Okay. And then from there, you can animate the base and get people to come out. So I think what many smart, savvy politicians, particularly in the Trump and, uh, campaign and the Republican uh, caucus have realized is that this issue is that th there's millions of Americans that are passionate about Bitcoin and they're passionate about it to the extent that that is driving a lot of their energy, drives where their money goes, right? Converting it from fiat into Bitcoin. And that one issue is enough to animate a base that probably would be a little reluctant to back, um, you know, Republicans or back to Republicans generally, um, they want to use that issue to get people out to the polls. And what I've heard from several staffers is that even among left leaning younger voters, that they are there's data showing they're crossing the aisle potentially to vote for Republican candidates if they come out passionately pro crypto and pro Bitcoin. So in a very close election, if you can shave off even a couple percentage points from the Democratic base of young people and get them to move to the Republican Party. And at the same time, if you can get your your base that is already with you out to the polls and animated by stuff like Ross Ulbricht getting pardoned, stuff like Bit the Bitcoin ETFs and, and, and other the Ethereum ETFs getting approved, that's enough, right, to hold uh, perhaps sway the election. It's going to, you know, those swing collars counties that are around many metropolitan areas that are going to decide the election. Those are uh, really going to be potentially coming down to hundreds of votes. So I think it's all just a calculus of how do we get those last little votes out of the out of the bucket to get us across the finish line. Do you think, you know, obviously there's a ton of people right now, you wake up today, you know, Friday, May 31st, as we're recording this, and people are, you know, the Republic's over, or the democracy, or, you know, people don't even know what to call America anymore. They don't, you know, they don't, the brainwashing goes so deep. Where, you know, from the lawfare, the things that are going on, I mean, how do you view being an attorney? Uh, you know, how do you view what you're seeing right now? How do you view the, the system as it stands? Uh, you know, can we just the Republic as it stands, but also, you know, just the lawfare, we're seeing the legal system 
what do you see going forward? You know, like, <clears throat> I guess, give your overview just really quickly, maybe of the, the Trump thing, maybe put people at ease or you could fire them up, I guess. But what do, what do you see going forward? Like what people don't have confidence, right? It's like the Bubba effect. People don't have confidence in any institution, uh, really seemingly like where, where do you see the legal profession going after this? Yes, I, I think you hit the head, nail on the head and you were going to go right, right where I would go. I, I think for the last, well, basically since the Obama election in 2008 um, and the hope that came with his administration um, for people generally, it was, it was bipartisan, right? I think a lot of people, even conservatives, hoped that something would come of that. And I think what we, we found is that the institutions, even with a, somebody as charismatic as Barack Obama, whether you like him, hate him, Right. Just like his policies, he was a charismatic, powerful speaker and influenced a lot of people. The fact that even he couldn't get things through with his is uh, that were positive for the country from an institution standpoint left people saying this system is just irreparably broken. Right? There's nothing we can do, and it's not just our political structures that are broken. It's aspects of the judiciary. It's aspects of um, uh, society at large. Right? Like you know the famous line from A Big Short. You know we live in an era of fraud, and I think a lot of people they mistake the fact that our institutions are antiquated and broken currently that they, with the idea that they can't be reformed, that there's no way to fix them. And that's not my view. Um, I think that, you know, antiquated institutions often are forced to reform and they're forced to innovate in the face of technology, right? Technology moves much faster uh, than um, I think that, than, than government does, and that's purposeful. And eventually government has to adapt for the 21st century. And I think a lot of that's what we're seeing in Bitcoin, right? Um, you know, perversions of the money supply, manipulations by central bankers of the cost of capital. These types of things, I think, are antiquated ways of running the world. And what Bitcoin is forcing these policymakers to confront over time is how do you deal with this technology that's unruly and uncooperative and it is uh, chipping away slow and steadily at our control of the system. So my view is that I, you know, I don't, I'm not a doomer, right? I don't right. think everything's going to collapse. I think what, what happens is in, in situations like ours is you tend to see that the, the technology wins out in the end, that the policymakers and central planners are forced to adapt, that it gives people the tools they need to um, safeguard their, uh, their liberty, to safeguard their value. And in the end, I think that the institutions bend to the technology. That's my overall view. Uh, I don't particularly view it as something that has to be violent or chaotic. I think it's more of a, a slow death, right? Like I, I like to say, uh, I like to quote the T.S. Eliot line that the world ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. Um, that's my view. I think it's just going to be something where peacefully people just wake up and realize and they build political clout uh, to reform the system. And I think Bitcoin's a big part of that. The fact that you have major presidential candidates on both sides of the aisle right now advocating for cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, I think is a testament to the fact that these technologies are powerful, that they have inspired the hearts and minds of millions of Americans and, and billions of people will eventually across the globe, I think, be drawn to the idea because it is an idea that's time has come. So from my perspective, I think I'm very optimistic that technology wins out in the end. And it's just a question of how long. OK, it's a, I can see situations where this takes a lot longer than people expect. I can see situations where gradually then yeah. suddenly, like the right. Bitcoiners say, um, I don't I'm not smart enough to figure out the path. <laughs> Right. And, and path is not uh, necessarily, uh, uh, you know, the key thing for this. What, what's key is really, you know, what will happen. And I think my my view is even if you get the timing wrong, if you're on the right side of this, you're going to be far better off than than not. Yeah. It, you know, th like days like today or, or yesterday or whatever, it feels like it's the acceleration route, like the gradually then suddenly. And it's like I know a lot of us, yes. you know, the early adopters or people that are in Bitcoin now or, or in the last 15 years. You know, you're you're trying to educate people, and even the even the gold bugs, like people for decades, you're 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 trying to educate people on on things so that we don't have to go the acceleration route. And there's not a lot of collateral damage, and that's where, like you said, I, I don't know if it ends up it's a it's a bang or if it's it happens gradually. It, to me, it feels like the the older generations they're going to be out of power in all in all aspects of life. Really, the next ten years here, this decade, which ironically is the gold rush. Michael Saylor just started kind of talking about in the next ten years. And in the world, I don't even think we can, we can't even predict where the world's going to be. It's going to change so rapidly because the younger generations are coming in. And, and to your point, the T.S. Eliot thing, I was just listening to that the other day. And I think that, I don't know if that's from the, the Hollow Men uh, that he wrote, I, I believe, but he, mm -hmm. it was a, 
the 4chan post, someone had written like 10 years ago about that uh, poem and just saying like, we're, we're going to, it's not going to be people dragging each other in the street, like you just said, and taking each other out. It, like to me, like I, I look at it like we've already lived through the, the depression the last 40, 50 years, actually. Like people think it's like some boom time and really it's 40, 50 years of divorces, of chaos, WTF happened in 1971. We're kind of like at the back end of it. And that's why it's accelerating. Do you kind of concur with that? Is that kind of how you see it too? Or do you see it a different way? I think that there's been severe hardship in the United States and erosions of what we had associated with with boom times, mm -hmm. right? Like we've slowly seen um, the, the division, particularly in, on the wealth inequality front between, you know, the haves and the right. have nots, and that's only accelerating. And, and I think that's part of the reason why people are so frustrated when they, they see the economic data and they see people running up credit card balances and they see people struggling with higher cost of, um, you know, consumer prices and inflation, but then they see the stock market and they say, this doesn't make any sense. We want to thank our sponsor. This show is presented by Bitcoin trading cards and orange pill in a pack making talking about things that normally make you want to cry fun and easy. The scarcest and most educational cards to ever exist. Available now. Sense. I think it makes perfect sense, right? It's a concentration between the haves and the have-nots, and that's exactly what I would expect to see where, you know, people are using economic power, uh, the Cantillion effect, right, to generate more wealth, and then the people who don't have access to assets, they're struggling a lot more. But something you said that, that was really interesting that I, I kind of want to point out is that um, – most people, uh, when they're looking at technological adoption curves, I think they get uh, confused at associating Bitcoin with purely a, you know, a, a growth cycle, an adoption cycle like, you know, cell phones, like mobile phones, like the Internet. Um, I, I don't see it that way. Personally, my view is that you've got obviously the technological adoption cycle, but you've also got profound political issues that need to be confronted and are, are, are brought up directly by Bitcoin. Right. So so modeling it off of something like the Internet, where, you know, I, I grew up, you know, when the Internet came of age. Um, and I think that, like, generally, there were people that were skeptical of the Internet. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have the hatred of it. You didn't have the policymakers as bitter towards it, like some are, like the Elizabeth Warren wings are with respect to Bitcoin. I think that's really important. And the reason why I think it's important is because I think when you're looking at technologies like Bitcoin, you have to realize not only does it have to cross the chasm of the adoption by convincing people this is better money and it's better technology, it also has to cross the chasm of politics, right? And it will, right? My big, big point I like to emphasize, this will happen. It's only a matter of time, right, in my mind. But what I will tell you is that um, you know, politics moves a little bit slower and there are institutional hurdles in place. There are regulatory hurdles and legal challenges that come and that can push back against what I think is the tsunami coming in the way of Bitcoin and, and, and larger adoption of the asset. So you have to factor that in, right? People are frustrated because things take slower. In my view, like, like, no, that's part of the process. It's, it's part of reforming the politics to have to deal with these huge embedded issues like who controls the money supply, right? Who controls the cost of capital? That's not something that's merely going to be about, well, we need to convince people this is better. That's something where we actually have to reform the system and the institutions that are broken that we were talking about. Yeah. Do you see, so talking about doomerism really quick, you know, you and you and Larry LaFarber going back and forth the other day, and I know you guys have respect for each other, um, but uh, yeah, I, I love both you guys. And I love the way you guys think about the world. How do you, how do you, because I, I find this tough to, like, I, I can get into doomerism. We all can, we're human. I mean, but you, you try to make a cognizant, like a real approach to, to, you know, reframing and reframing. How do you stay balanced? How do you say, Hey, I'm going to just be idealistic and optimistic and, and keep looking at this version of things and how, like what, what keeps you balanced when you're, when you're trying to reframe your own mind and, and thinking of things? Well, I think the easiest way is that I have faith in human beings to, to make the right decision in the end. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I think that human beings, uh, although, you know, primarily self-interested, right? There, there are aspects of altruism and they, they, they people want to, they care about their kids. They care about the next generation. They want to leave the world in a better place. I have a fundamental belief that at, at its core, most people are good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe people disagree with that. Maybe people think most people in this world of billions of people are evil and wicked. Um, there definitely are, there definitely is evil and wickedness in the world. I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, want to disagree with right. that. Um, I'll just tell you that the majority of people, most people, I think are fundamentally good. 
I think they're innovators. I think human beings are extraordinary creatures that are able to fix any problem in their way. And I, and I really believe that somebody put in my, well, you can't fix every problem. You can't fix an asteroid headed to the earth. Well, we could leave the earth, right? We could, we could, I think there, there are lots of, I mean, okay. It's a little bit hyperbolic to say every problem. Um, you know, there are limits to our life. There are limits to our bodies. Um, that that's true. Right. But like, we, we don't approach it. You don't approach the exercise saying like, well, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. We can't achieve that. We can't cure cancer. We can't fix our economic system. I approach it saying, let's think about what we can do. Let's focus on how we can confront challenges that stand in our path. And to me, like, you know, some of these issues that people complain about and say that it's going to be the downfall of humanity. Uh, I think you just got to study history, right? Things were very dark. Um, at very point, various points of our history. We were hours away from global thermal nuclear war in the 1960s. I was just talking with David Bailey on the space about this, okay? Mm -hmm. For people that say, world's so unstable right now, everything's falling apart, you literally had the two biggest superpowers in the history of humanity training weapons on each other to eradicate each other. And we could have ended up, you know, uh, leaving the earth uh, to cockroaches. That, that's the kind of situation we were in. And for people to say that that wasn't scary and depressing or that that was, you know, not as scary and depressing as the situation we have now, I just disagree with that. I think that our problems now in many respects are trivial and insignificant um, compared to, you know, things our, our, our forefathers had to deal with. Um, there's this great meme. I think it's I think it's really funny. I shared it. Um, several months ago, it was this like conquistador who said like, I, I had seven sons and I've lost all of them and I've lost my land. It's been conquered. And yet, and nevertheless, I must fight on, right? Like I, I, I believe that we can win this war. Right. And then you've got that juxtaposed against, uh, you know, the typical, uh, millennial who's complaining about how McDonald's forgot to include his, his uh, bucket of fries in his, uh, you know, his sack for lunch, right? That, oh, my life is so terrible. Why can't I get good customer service from fast food? I mean, come on, give me a break. These things, the things that most of the time, the things we're complaining about are trivial and insignificant compared to what our ancestors had to deal with. Plagues, wars, famine, things breaking down, people not even allowing you to, you know, we get, we, we get complain, uh, people complain about like censorship on the internet and how we can't, yes, that's a big deal, right? I, I believe in, uh, you know, free speech. I get all that, right? But there were people for the course of you know, human history who were purposefully not allowed to learn to read, right? They were not allowed to learn to write because it would challenge the state. Um, there, there are examples of this throughout history where extremely onerous draconian rulers basically crippled fundamental liberties of humanity. So, you know, whenever you start complaining about something, I always say study history and learn a little bit of perspective. Yeah, it's it's so funny you say that. I mean, I and I, I couldn't agree more. And it's what I I know when I get like long term, I'm I I feel so optimistic because of exactly the things you say. And the times I feel pessimistic in the short term or doomer is is short term. And it's when I find myself lacking in faith a little bit, even like I I just you know and then and just a little bit of lack of faith and maybe spending too much time online and and being in an echo chamber or whatever it is. So just removing yourself uh, is is one of those things where it's just like okay and just. Uh, so I love that frame that you say that, um, you know, in, in saying some of that and kind of, um, you know, transitioning a little bit, we have the, you know, what what's happened here all of a sudden with uh, the ETH, you know, ETFs, uh, you know, the tax on self custody, you know, all these things and all this, you know, yeah. all, uh, talk about doomerism. I mean, a month ago, just, I mean, I don't even know if it was a month ago, I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin or crypto world who were like, preparing for war they're like oh boy like what 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 are we what's going on are people getting arrested like what are what's going to happen here and all of a sudden just changes overnight and we talked about the political aspects you know stuff like that but seemingly like behind in the background it does look like there's some uh, you know attacks i guess if you call it uh, towards self custody there's some things in the background underneath the surface that are still going on where, where do you see this kind of playing out going forward i know it's somewhat hard to prognosticate obviously just knowing who's going to be in office yeah. to me Trump, I think, might give us runway to just keep building. I don't care who, you know, they can lip service all they want. I don't care, but it, he might just give us the runway to be out of our hair. How do you see things kind of playing out, I guess, in, in the next few months, more importantly, the next few years? Well, I, I mean, to me, if the polls are to be trusted, I think it's going to be a tough road for the the Biden campaign. So I'll, I'll start there. And, and I think that it, uh, there's a fundamental difference in the path we take between if the Trump administration is elected because it's going to be in the Biden administration, because I think it's going to be really hard uh, for the Elizabeth Warren uh, school of thought 
uh, with respect to Bitcoin and crypto to take hold under a Trump administration. I think that that's effectively dead, uh, at least dead for, for four years, right? So, so the path will be it's wildly different. Um, if you had a Trump presidency, I think you're going to see adoption rates of Bitcoin and crypto, to be honest, um, accelerate rapidly because I just don't mm-hmm. think they're going to be as uh, hard-handed with the industry. We might even get some positive legislation out of it. Um, that, that being said, okay, I really want to caution people uh, from mistaking the fact that one presidential candidate or one party is going to be sufficient to uh, eliminate all the threat vectors, right, that could could um, come to an industry as powerful and, like I said, as impactful as something like Bitcoin. Because even with a president that supports something, right, we know that doesn't necessarily mean that quiets all the regulators, the massive, uh, you know, uh, surveillance state, the massive uh, government bureaucracy that's behind it, um, prosecutors in various different jurisdictions, state regulators, you know, there's, there's a whole host, a whole apparatus of people that just at this point um, haven't seen the light yet. Okay. I believe that again, in the end, they will see the light, right? But can they, t- can they take a wild path that is rocky? I expect it to, right? My mental model that I go into it, and I think it helps with the optimism case, is you should expect a tax on self-custody. You should expect prosecutors that are overly zealous to come after folks that all want nothing more than to safeguard their value in an asset that they believe is the best asset to hold value, okay? And if you have that in your mental model, that that's coming, then what you should do, at least in my my view, is you shouldn't be surprised when you read a headline like prosecutors attacking somebody for having a mixing service or, you know, prosecutors uh, filing suits against folks um, and claiming their money transmitters. Um, these types of things are perfectly within the framework of what you would expect. And when they come down, you just have to realize, OK, well, this is an issue that the courts are going to have to deal with. This is an issue that legislature, legislators are going to have to eventually deal with. It will take time. It will be frustrating. People will get hurt by, uh, like I said, overzealous prosecutors. Um, but, you know, that's part of our system. Our system works over time, gradually and slowly. That's not that's very frustrating for a generation that is uh, uh, hooked on instant gratification of the Internet. Right. But. You would rather us go through the process in an orderly way and knowing that there's going to be scrutiny uh, than not. Uh, Just to give you one quote, you know, Brick Mahler's um, Jack's mother posted on Twitter that when they were audited, uh, that one of the uh, IRS agents they spoke with said that self-custody was a red flag, right? That was something that that you're probably ending up in a database in if you do self-custody, okay? Uh, My reaction to that is that's unfortunate. It's wrong, right? Let's state that state that at the at the mm-hmm. outset. But is that really unexpected? Are you really surprised by the government not uh, sort of focusing more on these people that want to do something new and novel? I I, I think it's entirely expected, mm-hmm. right? I I I expect everybody who's doing self custody and has their name KYC and attached to an exchange is in some database somewhere, or at least there is some database at the IRS where that exists. Um, I don't view that as scary. It doesn't change my view on Bitcoin. It doesn't prevent me from holding Bitcoin in self-custody. It's just kind of like, duh, right? We know that that's there and don't be surprised by it. And, you know, be prepared for scrutiny in in the future. When I talk to folks, and and you've probably heard me say this on, on Twitter, like, be careful about what you say because anything can and will be used against you by a regulatory state, by enforcement actors that are antagonistic towards the asset. And we know those people exist throughout the government. There are also people that exist at every layer of the government that are supportive, okay? Even from the state, local, and federal level. I know judges that hold Bitcoin, okay? High up influential people that believe in the asset. And that should also be in your mental models. And we don't give enough um, attention to those people, mostly because they're quiet, right? They're, they're sort of more reserved than the people out there, hell and brimstone, saying that this asset is, uh, you know, is, is is the Brad Sherman's world, that, that it's undermining the dollar and it's going to cause a collapse of the system. Wait, so, yeah, I mean, you laid out so many great points there and it makes me think of a, a bunch of different things. I mean, like, again, part of it is, you know, I I agree. Again, I was telling you, I'm married to an attorney and I my father-in-law's attorney, grand, their, the grandfather's attorney, you know, so like... I, I understand the system well too. I actually thought about going to law school and almost did. And so 
I, I I'm of that world in a sense where I, you have to have that and you have to have, like you said, emotions come down and things need to take a while. They need to be orderly. Now I think the Trump stuff, even all this stuff, rightfully so in a way people are now questioning that whole system. And now it's like, well, what do I do? You know, what happens mm -hmm. now? And I think the thing that, you know, you're not scared to ruffle feathers out there. And I think that the problem, and I, again, I see this myself even, and I see it in a large part with the Bitcoin community. I think the contingent of Bitcoiners now, like people tend to be very idealistic and, and you're saying, Hey, we need to live in the world now as it is. Like, don't tell me how you think it's going to be, or should be like, you're going to be in a database and that is what it is. And I think that's the thing that's hard for people to at least Bitcoiners to like work their minds around right now. Well, well, it shouldn't be that way, Joe. We, you know, and, and so like, I guess the, the question is, what do we do? Like, how do we change things? Is it just holding Bitcoin and self custody and just kind of sit in the corner of the bunker and wait and, and for this you know, younger people to come in and be in power or like is it no. tort reform? Like, what what do we do? <laughs> I, listen, I I have a law practice. Um, obviously, I have clients outside of Bitcoin, um, outside of the digital asset space, and you know I speak my mind. I I occasionally go too far <laughs> speaking my mind. You you may know that, right? I mean, as we all yeah, do. We all do. Um, but like, you know, that's not a way to live, right? I mean, I, I, I don't believe in, you know, cowering in the corner. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, and I don't begrudge anyone who wants to stay anonymous and don't, doesn't want to deal with that. That's your choice, right? That's your personal choice. I don't, right? I use my real name on Twitter. I post my real thoughts all the time. <laughs> People, you know, talk to me about every issue under the sun. I try to be um, smart and kind and nice to people. I fail, uh, of course, uh, many times, but, but the reason is like, I, I want to live my life and I want to be able to express myself and I don't want to cower in the corner because if you're cowering in the corner and you, uh, you, you, you have your speech chilled, uh, by people that would want you to stay quiet, you almost are, are you're get, letting them win, mm -hmm. right? That's letting the folks that are antagonistic towards you win. And that's not how I choose to you to choose to do it. What I, what I, what I try to do and people say, Oh, you're, you're too reserved. You're trying to be politically correct. It's not that I try to be smart with my speech and things I want to pick a fight on. Okay. Yeah. Because I know I, I, my a mentor of mine told me long ago, Brandon, um, that when you put something in writing or you say something in a public forum, you should assume that it will be printed on the front page of the New York Times, right? Like you should assume it will be everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great lesson, right? Uh, even when you're in a public setting, even when you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you know that things can be taken out of context and, and there's no way to avoid it these days, especially with like the deep fake stuff that's out there, even if you're not saying it right, there are videos of people saying things that they're not saying and, and using it against them. So I don't really see it, it, it as a virtue or a benefit to cower in the corner. I would, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, getting the, your view out there and trying to communicate effectively and where you fail, own it and make, say I made a mistake and I was wrong about that. And uh, I mean, that's just, that's just my view. And, and with respect to Bitcoin, right? I've said this many times um, that if they try to ban self-custody, if the government tries to be uh, clamped down in certain things that I think are a line in the sand, I'm prepared to go file suits myself on behalf of myself in federal court or wherever I need to file to enforce my rights. Um, I have that privilege because I went to law school and got a law right. degree and I can, I can fight for the things I want. Other people aren't that way. So I don't begrudge them if they want to take a different approach. I can only do what, I think is right for Joe and what's a good path. And I will tell you this, I'm not scared of them banning Bitcoin. If they want to ban Bitcoin, it will be the fight of the century and we're ready to do it. Uh, we're ready to fight it. Um, I'm ready to fight it. Even if I be the only man out there on my own doing it. Okay. That's just my view. Um, so no, I mean, I, I, all of this in my, my mind has to happen. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would almost rather the government clamp down extremely hard on Bitcoin in the short run, because if they do it, it, it accelerates the yeah. fights, right? It brings it to the forefront instead of what I don't like, what I think is sneaky and manipulative is the choke point 2.0 stuff where you've got people off the record yes. doing things behind the scenes, telling people that we need to, uh, you know, shut this down or we, you need to stop doing business with this crypto company or this crypto entity. That to me is, is horrible, right? That's the cold war where you don't actually get out the real message. And I think it is frankly shocking that, we didn't get a national news uh, attention to what Barney Frank said, right? A Democrat, former chair of the House Financial Services Committee, very influential former yeah. Democrat. He said that they killed Signature Bank because it was pro-crypto. Mm -hmm. That should have been headlines all over the 
all over the planet, all over the crypto space. I've only seen it referenced a couple times by a handful of insiders. The fact that they made a calculated decision to kill a banking entity because it partnered with crypto companies does not get enough attention. And if there's one thing you should use as a talking point coming out of this interview is that you should focus on the fact that you've got a, a, a seemingly neutral party who has nothing to gain there. Barney Frank, I know he was on the board, but you get my point. He, right. he was somebody that, that, that had influence in our government. And he is saying on the record, to people that they killed this banking entity because it was pro crypto. That is appalling. And that's un American. And really quick, I'd love for you to touch on the some of the I didn't see everything yesterday. But I know, like, again, they were dropping some of the Supreme Court cases, obviously, in the last day or so as well. And you had the NRA thing, which was this has been going on for a long time, too, right? So you know, this is a, it's a constitutional right. And we have, you know, people in the background, the choke point style urging people in New York to not do banking with the NRA. And this is a problem obviously it's been going on for a long time i would love for you to kind of maybe extrapolate on this more maybe even touch on some of the the cases or what you found kind of interesting in the last day or so with the supreme court cases because yeah i i hadn't uh as i was telling you before we got on i haven't read up on the cases so i don't like to comment okay. on stuff that i haven't been informed on uh but I, what i'll just tell you um this current supreme court has shown a penchant for reining in overreach mm -hmm. from the executive branch which I think is a good yeah. thing, right? That's a positive thing. And people should take note of that, that this court is willing to push back against the bulwark of, uh, of the legis of executive overreach. And that's positive, right? Yeah. So from my standpoint, I think that you should know that at least there are some voices in, in the high, on the highest court in the land that are willing to hear about um, the federal overreach, particularly with the SEC and some of that, and realize that when a government actor does something in our system, whether it's the SEC or other regula regulators, there are there's a process to challenge it. That is the court system, right? Our court system, in, in the beauty in which the founders designed our designed uh, the United States system, it was designed to curtail executive overreach, okay, and legislative overreach through passing bills that are unconstitutional. Even if a bill gets passed, right, that doesn't mean it's lawful, okay. It means it's, it is the law currently, but you have a challenge. Uh, the ability to challenge it in the federal court system or other court systems, and it can be strict, struck down as unconstitutional. This happens un regularly, right? We know through history that uh, lawmakers exceed their enumerated powers under the Constitution. Um, so, you know, the overall tenor of what I, I think I want to respond to your question is, is that, you know, what, what I see happening and what is, is concerning to me and what needs, there needs to be challenges, affirmative challenges brought by affected participants is that when the government decides we can't win in the courts, we don't have the tools we need, the, the, the regulators say we don't have the tools we need to actually clamp down on crypto, and they use unofficial uh, tactics like in Choke Point 2.0 mm -hmm. to kill entities or to undermine banking partners or to do indirect attacks, people need to be out there, one, exposing it in the public forum through the press and through other channels, but two, they need to be willing to fight legal challenges to bring it to court. Right. You know, Caitlin Long suing the Federal Reserve. Uh, th those types of things are powerful um, and people willing to, you know, God bless people that are willing to take those fights because they need to be made. Just saying we're going to wrap it up and, you know, not do anything uh, in the United States. I think that's a wrong tactic. It's concerning to me that crypto companies are just leaving the United States thinking that they can, you know, protect themselves by just fleeing the U.S. borders, because I will tell you, leaving the United States, but still somehow catering to people here is still going to expose you to significant, uh, the long arm of the U.S. government. So uh, for me, I, I, I'm, I'm a fighter, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of trying to bring these fights that need to be made. We just have to be strategic about what we're fighting about. The so okay so yeah there's 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 so many things you could par parse through here it's just wild what do you so it makes me think I think it was Bonhoeffer that said you know like people just don't care uh like people don't care about things and, you know it's the quote of like they came for the Jews and no one did anything they came for the so you know whatever and they finally came for me and no one is there to stand right and so it, it feels like that's where we're at but it almost feels in a way like Trump has become a proxy for a lot of those people. Like it almost stops somewhere along that line of the three or four groups of people he kind of outlined years ago. And all of a sudden Trump became a proxy of then they came for me. Mm -hmm. And there, that's why there's a ton of fervor. Um, but 
again, like you look at like him flipping this script on, on the crypto stuff and all of a sudden Biden's chasing his tail. Um, so, I mean, it gives, I know some people probably some, you know, like, okay, this is, this is good. Now we're flipping the script here. What do you like in terms of Ethereum and just even the rest of the, of the, the crypto world, obviously you have the XRP stuff going on. You had all these, what is it? The Samurai guys getting arrested. You have the Dame, uh, you know, bill attacking mining and all this different stuff. Where do you see, like, how, what is the SEC doing? You know, like what, all of a sudden there is just, is, is it the commodity is a security? Like they're just like usurping laws. Like what, like. Can you make sense of this just for the average person of like where like where we're, sure. where we're at in this? Sure. So um, you as someone who studied what the SEC, how the SEC has been treating Bitcoin and crypto for years now, um, I, I first started really seriously studying it back in 2016. I think the only fair way that you can describe their policy is haphazard and confused, mm -hmm. right? I don't think that there has been a clear understanding of the asset class and understanding of their path towards um, their, their approach rather to the asset class since basically when they were first dealing with the, these cases, right? They have had a confused approach and they've made contradictory statements. They've had people in 2018, this director Hinman going out there and speaking, which the SEC took the position. He wasn't speaking for the SEC. He was speaking for himself, but he's a director of the SEC speaking in a public forum about SEC policy. So it's kind of a, a gray area there. He was saying how assets can transform from being, you know, uh, a, a security, an investment contract who's sufficiently decentralized and he introduced this concept without any basis in the law. I mean, that kind of stuff was just bizarre. The fact that they were, they were, they were giving these confused statements and letting people giving them the indication in 2018 that assets could transform somehow from the, their, their different statuses. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very bizarre sort of approach rather than just give better guidance, which they could have done. Um, now, there's obvious reasons why they don't want to give guidance. They don't want to give guidance because lawyers that get the guidance can then use it to their detriment when they bring enforcement action and say, this is what you told us to do, and we did it, and you can't complain because we followed your advice. So they left this gray area where they say, well, enforcement is our regulation. We're going to handle the area through, through one-off cases. Well, what that does is that forces people to hypothesize and to anticipate what is or is not something that's going to run afoul of U.S. law. And that's a terrible place to be in. It's an awful place for market participants who want nothing more than to have lawful conduct to have to guess with lawyers what is and isn't appropriate. So I think the, the approach that they've taken for years has been, we're not going to tell you with broad guidance what something is or is not. We're going to do what's called a smell test. If we think it smells like a security, we think it smells like an investment contract, you're going to find out that, that we think it smells like an investment contract when we sue your ass in court. <laughs> Pardon my language. Okay. That's, but that's basically, that's basically their policy. Um, you get a Wells that. notice. You, you know that there's going to be some you know, enforcement action coming against you. That's when you know uh, something's bad. Well, that's terrible. Um, now, what you've seen is that they took the approach. Okay, They're really forced by two entities. They're forced by the CME and they're forced by the CFTC, which approved futures products on Bitcoin and Ethereum to eventually approve the ETFs. Okay? They took the position that even if the futures ETFs were approved and the futures contracts are traded on a regulated financial institution like the CME, we're not going to approve the Bitcoin spot ETF. We're not going to approve the Bitcoin spot ETF because we think there are market structure issues that there was potentially manipulation and spoofing in the underlying spot market, and we're not going to allow that to go forward. Well, the court system, again, we talked about the court system reigning in executive overreach. They said that's wrong. They said it's arbitrary and capricious for you to differentiate between the spot and futures products. And because of that, we got the Bitcoin spot ETF. That was the only reason we, I think it ever would have gotten approved. The Grayscale case where Grayscale brought suit and, and, and filed uh, and was able to defeat the SEC on a very tough standard showing that they were arbitrary and capricious. That basically forced the SEC's hand to allow the Bitcoin spot ETF through. And I think they were prepared to go back to court on the Ethereum spot ETF. I think that was all by all indications and all accounts of people close to the situation, the SEC was going to refuse to let that through. And the only thing that changed their mind in letting the applicants actually have it and, um, you know, with their 19 Bs, get them across the line was the fact that you had the grayscale decision and 
now we've got a political issue in advance of election where the administration doesn't want to appear to be anti crypto, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They, so in other words, what I expect would have happened had the Trump campaign not forced this issue and not made it a talking point and had the House not, you know, passed a piece of positive crypto legislation, I expect what would have happened is the SEC would have dragged their feet and said, go sue us, try to beat us again in court, we'll raise new arguments. But because by all accounts, the White House and other higher end folks intervened, that caused them, okay, you're probably going to lose in court on this anyway, let's pick our battles and be more strategic. And they said, just stand down on this and let it pass through. I think by all accounts, if you sort of harmonize the different players we're dealing with, that's the most likely scenario. Now, to answer your final question, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but um, you asked me, what does this mean? Does this mean ETH is a commodity? And what I want to emphasize again, and I say this on every space, it does not matter what the asset itself is in an investment contract analysis, Okay. You go back to the Howey test, which many people are familiar with. The underlying asset was orange groves, okay? But selling the orange groves, which were to be maintained and operated by another party and you would gain a benefit, that, that lease, that, that economic activity, that was an investment contract, even if the underlying thing was a commodity. Similarly, okay, if I give you Bitcoin and you tell me you're going to give me yield on my Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not a security, right? But you are entering into an investment contract with Bitcoin because you are promising me a reasonable expectation of return from you getting yield on the Bitcoin. The same is true of Ethereum. Regardless of whether the thing itself, the lines of code that are Ethereum, regardless of whether that is an investment contract, what the government is saying is that depending on the transaction, the economic transaction, it could be, right? So the idea that staking as a service, which is offered by, by Coinbase, that that is not an investment contract simply because an ETF was approved, I think is fundamentally wrong. I expect the SEC to continue to take the position that if you're staking as a service on behalf of others, that is an investment contract, even if ETH itself is not. And the same is true of Ripple and other assets, right? The idea is, what is the economic transaction? If I'm selling an ICO and I'm telling people we're going to have a dev team and we're going to build out this protocol and it's going to be the next Bitcoin and this thing's going to 10,000x, the SEC is going to say that is an investment contract. What is the investment contract is not the code. Okay, Brandon, I want to make, make that very clear. It's not the code because code in, its, in and of itself is not mm -hmm. a security. What is the investment contract is the fact that the devs are selling it to other people, giving them a reasonable expectation of profit, okay? And they're taking their money for it. That, that is the key securities analysis. And that's how Congress intended that statute to be analyzed. They intended it to be analyzed in the sense of the economic activity, the economic realities test, okay? What actually is the transaction here as opposed to what is the asset? And that, that's one of the things we need to get better at in, in the Bitcoin community. I was just telling my wife about, uh, I was in a, right when I stopped playing professional hockey, I got into network marketing and my, my first foray into entrepreneurship, uh, you know, 12 years ago or whenever it was, it was Vima. And I don't know if you remember, but that was, that was attacked by the government after a few years because it blew up. It was a, a, a it was a multivitamin energy drink and had a bunch of other products and yeah. Yeah. And it got attacked by the government because kids were making money hand over fist. Like it was blowing up on colleges. I'd never seen anything like it before. And, sure. and it, it got taken down after like five years and just, you know, the CEO destroyed his family, had like six kids and, and, you know, he got divorced and all these things. And, they're, and they were saying, well, they're, you're promoting, like you were just saying, it made me think of it, like, well, they're just promoting the economic, uh, you know, viability of it and just the, the opportunity. And there's, and it's like, yeah, there's a product there, you morons. Like it's, it, they, they just targeted these people because they were young kids making tons of money, like, you know, tons and tons of kids all over the country, all over the world. And it was wild to see, like right. you said, like kind of this targeted, like flip flopping and like just selective rule, you know, it was just, it was just wild. So it made me just think of that. Um, do you have any fears of, yeah. Of, of being sorry, you can you touch on that, but also, do you have any fears of speaking of the ETFs? Any fears of centralization and more Bitcoin going into the coffers of of the ETFs themselves? Um, well, obviously, I would prefer more people to hold Bitcoin um, natively, mm -hmm. right? To hold it by by themselves in self custody. Uh, 
To me, though, I think that, and this kind of goes into the macro discussion, I think it is, um, I think it is misguided to, again, not have an expectation as your base case that a lot of powerful institutions across the world will hold significant amounts of Bitcoin because powerful institutions hold significant amounts of wealth, right? And whether it's banks or corporations, et cetera, you know, if, you, if you're going to believe Bitcoin's going to succeed and proliferate, all I expect them all to yeah. hold some amount of Bitcoin. Um, I was, yeah, right. So, so, you know, unless, I mean, even unless you don't think there's going to be any banks in the future, <laughs> which is not my view, right? What is the underlying asset banks are going to hold? Banks at one point in our history held gold, right? We know, and, and the central banks hold, held gold. Um, I, I expect it to be sort of that settlement layer, you know, technology that banks are utilizing. So why is it a surprise that third party custodians are going to hold a lot of Bitcoin? And I think what will be interesting to me is that there will be people and there will be incentives um, for those people to attract them to give their Bitcoin to third party custodians in the future. I think that's going to be a decades long uh, discussion we're having about what appropriate risk uh, you want to associate with others. And to me, I don't really see a negative on that other than the fact that those people entrusting their Bitcoin with other institutions have to realize that it's not like, um, you know, paper. It's not like uh, fiat, right, where, where it can just be taken away and then replaced by more fiat, right? That Bitcoin is rare. Um, it is unique, meaning one of a kind, right? It, you, the, every Bitcoin, every Satoshi is, is unique. And you're not, you, although they're fungible, right? You're not going to replace it with more of the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least uh, I don't think you will, like in terms of, um, you know, the government's not going to come and bail out, you know, a Bitcoin bank right. that, that collapses because they can't, right. right? It's just, it, it would not be possible. So to me, like the risk, my fears are people are going to learn this the hard way, and which has been the lesson of uh, Bitcoin for, you know, nearly a decade um, or more. Uh, the, the, the issue is like you trust your Bitcoin to a third party and that third party messes around and you figure out what happens, right? You suffer the consequence. And I have so many clients and people that come to me and say, I gave money to this entity or I gave money to this entity and then poof, it disappeared, right? Um, people have to, it has to be ingrained in the public consciousness and that we're nowhere near where that needs to be, okay? Not even close, um, you know, Bitcoin. And I don't think that's gonna happen with the ETFs. I actually think the ETFs, my view is that they're gonna mostly uh, safeguard the asset they're going to mostly take care of it. Maybe there's a hack. Maybe there's an issue at some point. I can't write, rule that out. Right. But, you know, you have big players that are uh, more reputable that are in the space. And, and the real key question for me will be, do the big players, once they've accumulated a massive amounts of Bitcoin, do the, the Black Rocks that are holding Bitcoin on behalf of others, do they start to try and influence development on Bitcoin? Um, and, and whether you dislike him or like him, I, I don't really care. But... It's interesting to me that Michael Saylor, who owns a significant amount of Bitcoin, is getting involved in the dev discussion, mm -hmm. right? Like what development should happen, what whether Bitcoin should ossify or not. Yeah. Um, you sh again, fully expected, not a surprise, right? If you have that kind of money at stake. Yeah. But, you know, I think what Bitcoin has taught us is that I don't care if you're Michael Saylor, if you're Brandon, if you're Joe, um, nobody has more sway over, you know, the consensus protocol and the, the decision making and the development than any other person. So from my standpoint, I think about, um, you know, does it get to a point where BlackRock's trying to develop and, you know, trying to maybe make changes to the code? Perhaps, right? Which is all the more reason why we need to be laser focused on decentralization so that they don't crowd out the voice of someone like Brandon yeah. and Joe. Um, and, and there's ways to do that, right? We can confront and, and, and fix all that. It's just a question of, are we going to be prepared to not sacrifice the decentralization uh, for the sake of convenience and efficiency? You can't. It's paramount. It, it's the only thing that makes it work. Yeah. I know we're, we're gearing towards the end here of, you know, five or 10 minutes left. What, what do you think? So in saying all that, what are your quick thoughts on the mining pools and the, the centralization, the, the concerns people have raised there? What are your, you know, quick thoughts on that? Just quick thoughts are, are very similar, right? I mean, like I'm, I'm a, a proponent of trying to distribute and decentralize Bitcoin uh, to the, the highest degree possible, right? And I don't like any actor or economic entity that can somehow 
influence what really should be sort of a one man or one woman vote type thing with Bitcoin. Like I think it should be focused on the node operators. The more power you can give to node operators, I think the better, because I think that increases the uh, the decentralization aspect and, and the mining pools. Um, you know, you're right. They're wildly concentrated. There's issues there. But again, those are issues we can work on and they can be fixed. There are smart people much brighter than I that are trying to fix these issues. And I think ultimately they will. Um, again, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I think it's just a question of, you know, do you have the right, uh, do you have the right ideas getting through to enough hearts and minds to convince them? And I think eventually they, the right ideas are going to win out. Do you think it's two, two more questions? I'm going to, we'll play a little, a little word game, a little lightning round to end it. Um, would, would you, th do yeah. you think it's more important for government? So kind of wrapping a lot of what we've been talking about here up into a bow in a way, do you think it's more important for bottom up, you know, people uh, forcing the change and in, in saying, you know, politics is downstream from culture. So like people adopting at the bottom and then forcing their politicians to change, obviously, and their governments to change through voting and, and discourse? Or is it the El Salvador approach of like, hey, we're gonna mandate this and it's legal tender, and, you know, currency? How do you see that playing out? Uh, is it you know, more important to, to get the sovereign wealth funds in that world, like at the top, or is it bottom up? We got to educate the people, teach the children. Like, how how do you see that kind of that adoption process playing out? Well, they're both important, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say one is 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 not important. I think in terms of if you're, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is acceleration, okay, to do this as quickly as possible. Um, it's clearly the sovereign wealth funds. It's clearly the big players. It's clearly Wall Street. And there's a real reason for that because those are the guys that have the power, money, and influence right now. Mm -hmm. So if they will port their power, money, and influence into Bitcoin, um, they can, they actually, what, what comes with those people, Brandon, is lobbyists, is, you know, is, is lawyers, groups of people that are influential, people that will go out there and get any night, any night of the week and twice on Sundays if they want to get on mainstream news or uh, have have their point made out. Larry Fink can do it, right? right? Larry Fink can pick up the phone and he can get out to millions of people to talk about how Bitcoin is hope, which is what he said, right? You and I can post all day long on Twitter um, about that and they're going to write us off as crazies and you know not listen to us. But people that are influential, that carry weight in society that are coming on board to it, that's going to make things accelerate. If your goal is sustainability and your goal is durability, that's kind of a more slow approach and that's a bottom up approach. So I see a lot of virtue in that and I, I appreciate it. I will tell you that I've been very critical publicly about the, you know, the legal tender because I don't think it makes any sense at all. Okay. Let's just explain what legal tender is. Legal tender is forcing someone by the state to accept a particular currency. Okay. And what Bukele has said publicly is that despite the fact we have a law in the books forcing people to expect Bitcoin, uh, forcing people to accept Bitcoin, we're not going to enforce it. And I, and I think to myself, well, what's the point? Why have a law on the books that is really just symbolic, mm -hmm. right? That says, oh, you should, you, you, sh you, you need to accept Bitcoin, but we're not going to prosecute you if you don't. Um, to me, he could have done a lot of other aspects. He could have El Salvador buy Bitcoin. He could give everybody Bitcoin like he did with the Shiva wallet, right? He could have done all these things and remove the section that's compulsory about having to accept Bitcoin. And I think you would have got basically the El Salvador you have today. Um, uh, you, you know, it, there's really no reason you need that com compulsion because if Bitcoin truly is better money, it's a better asset to, to utilize and store, it's going to win over organically. People are going to turn to it like you have, like I have. Um, they're going to do that naturally because they they appreciate the asset for what it is. So I'm I'm generally against government compulsion about what legal tender is. I much rather economic actors take that on. Um, what I do think would be helpful, kind of on the opposite end, is in the United States. We've talked a lot about like the de minimis exemption for taxes. I think that it would be a fundamental game changer in the United States if I did not have to report capital gains taxes when I buy something for $100 with Bitcoin. Right. That is absurd. Yeah. Um, it is antiquated. And if you want to look at the single biggest policy to drive bottom up adoption of Bitcoin in the United States, it's fixing the ridiculous tax policies and get some sort of de minimis exemption. That is so, so important. Yeah. Yep. So true. All right. Last one before we do a little lightning round. Uh, you want to get your your yeah. thoughts on the state of CBDCs? Obviously, this is 
kind of come back in the purview again. It was kind of down for a little bit and wasn't in the, on the radar of, of people. But now Trump has been talking about obviously Vivek and now Trump over the last little bit. This was my, I think you and I, this was, this is my one bone to pick with you. I think you and I, like a year ago around a space is like, it, it was like, it was a cafe Bitcoin and Sam, you know, it was a handful of us. And you, you know, I, I'm of the mindset of like, Hey, government's just going to do whatever the hell is good for them at that time. You were making the case that, you know, it's unconstitutional. They, they're not going to do a CBDC. They can't. I would love for you to give your thoughts on the state of the CBDC and just where you think that's at. And, you know, if, if your thoughts, if that's correct, and if you think, or if that's changed at all, and just kind of where you see, you know, is it viable, you know, DeSantis is doing, Oh, no, no CBDC here. And now Trump's saying you'll never have a CBDC. What are your thoughts on, on that and what the government may or may not do going forward? Okay. So part of this is like, uh, again, it's not to be semantics. It's just a definitional thing. A true central bank digital currency needs to be issued by the central bank. And as you know, mm -hmm. and as I hope the listeners know, our central bank is the Federal Reserve. Now, what Jerome Powell and every single member of, uh, well, district president um, for the Fed, they've all said repeatedly that we don't have legislative authority to do a CBDC, that you need to amend the Federal Reserve Act to permit a, a, a CBDC. Moreover, many members of the FOMC, other governors that have spoken out, they have said repeatedly that they don't see any real reason to have a US CBDC. They actually have said, uh, I think it's Williams, he said that he thinks private sector solutions are far more effective uh, at, at promoting uh, you know, the dollar and, and having it proliferate abroad. I think there is effort to get a stable coin bill passed through Congress, mm -hmm. which to me, that actually cuts against the argument for a stable for a CBDC. Mm -hmm. Why would you be taking steps to try to promote a stable coin, which is a private sector thing, when you are secretly planning behind the scenes to have some CBDC instituted? That makes no sense to me. Okay. So number one, you point out that we are very unlikely to get it during a Republican administration. Uh, they're, they're wildly against CBDC. So that's, that's, cut number one against it. Number two, I don't think you need it. I don't think it gives you much of authority that you wouldn't have with through other means. I mean, through the banking sector. Um, number number three, I think the banking lobby is extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. Okay. The banking lobby was, it was able to get uh, SAB 121. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the repeal of that bill. Uh, recently, they used their influence to get that repealed and you know, even in spite of a presidential threat of a veto, they were able to get that across the finish line. The notion that a CBDC, which would completely cut out the banks from the take, would get through the lobbying, the 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 lobbying opposition from banks, I think is just uh, extremely unlikely. And the only scenario where I can see myself, um, I can see there being very swift action for a CBDC getting it passed and pushed through would be some type of a crisis situation, right? Mm -hmm. Where literally you had things falling apart, which is not my base case. And I don't right. expect that to happen. I know other people in Bitcoin do. So God bless, that's your view. Um, I don't. I think that there will be far more intervention and uh, kicking the can down the road than people expect. So I don't, so for those three reasons, primarily, I don't really see a CBDC anywhere near on the horizon. And I think that uh, the, the legislative gridlock in our system is going to prevent it from getting enacted. Um, our Congress really just can't get anything done, right? right? Even even when we get things done, there's threat of presidential vetoes. And uh, especially if there's a um, a divided Congress coming out of the next election, which is what the, the polls seem to indicate, I would expect there to be slim to no chance of a CBDC unless there is a crisis that would justify it. Yeah, and you you touched on this earlier too, and we'll we'll wrap up this lightning round, but we you you're touching on this earlier. Like I was thinking of all these um these different two year spans over the last 20 years that were full control by either one side or the other. And there was generally nothing really done. And it, at least on the conservative side, Bush had it, Trump had it at least two years at different points where they had full control. And there was no departments cut. There was no, you know, we, we didn't see the Department of Education go away, like nothing really happened. And you were alluding to this earlier, again, just kind of the workings in, in the background of who's really pulling the strains and control. Things. Well, look, so. just Brandon, Brandon. So just, just for viewers that are perhaps not as um, familiar with this, okay? Uh, the Democrat, Democratic um, Senate, right, was basically hinging all their decisions on 
Joe Manchin. Yeah. And maybe another one or two Democrats. Like literally one man yeah. could hold up the entire legislative body uh, of the Senate, right? The, 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 there's an old saying they used to call the Senate the world's greatest deliberative body, right? Um, and, and you literally have a guy that's that they're not even doing voice filibusters anymore. They can just raise their hand and say, I filibuster yeah. and that's it and block any piece of legislation. Wow. So, you know, our system as it's currently constituted is built to resist change. And whether people like it or not, um, I mean, it's just the reality. And I think that most of the time, these boogeymen that we're confronted with, like CBDCs mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, insert your your your, yeah. your negative boogeyman piece of legislation that people are worried about, th there's like, like almost no chance of them getting passed, but for emergencies, right? right? When do they pass the Patriot Act? They pass the Patriot Act after 9-11. When do they get to pass Dodd-Frank, which introduced a whole slew of new, new regulations after the great financial crisis? When were they able to pass the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, right? All these, these big names that they throw out there they, during COVID, right? They push this stuff through during a crisis, okay? So the time you need to be on guard and worried, okay? And I don't really worry a whole lot but the, about legislation because I think you can challenge mm -hmm. it. Um, the time you need to be on guard, put it this way, is when there's a crisis because that's when people do stupid things. Yes. Yeah. Well said. And it's, I feel like it's the, there are all the trial balloons and they throw out like unrealized gains and they've thrown that out a couple years ago. Now they just threw out again and then they trial balloon it for a few years and yeah. then they wait till the crisis. Right. So yeah, it's, that's yeah. Brilliantly said. All right. Well, it's a talking point, yeah. right? It gets people, it gets, it's get, the, gets their base yeah, excited too. Yeah. It's either a distraction yeah. or like you said, fires up red meat for the base or whatever. One of those two things. All right, last segment, little uh, segment presented by Bitcoin Trading Cards. So our our company uh, running this pod, a uh, little lightning round with with Joe Calasari here. So yeah. uh, I'll just throw like a dozen or so words and then just say what comes to mind and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it here. Let's rock and roll. Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, brilliant. Politics. Uh, I think it's broken and will be reformed in time with technology influencing policymakers to act. Self custody. Essential. Extremely important for any individual to focus on. And if you need the gateway drug of the ETF, that's fine. But eventually find your way to self custody. The US Constitution. the single most powerful piece of writing probably in the history of humanity. Lawfare. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Was it lawfare? Yes. Um, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't hear it very well. Yeah, I was, I was saying lawfare, but I'll do this one. How about current state of the legal world? Oh, okay. Um, so I, I think the legal world is in a, a period of innovation and change. I think AI is going to completely disrupt um, uh, the entire uh, way we think about retaining lawyers and legal counsel. I think every lawyer out there who is not embracing artificial intelligence, at least for part of their practice as a tool, not as a replacement, mm -hmm. but as a tool to enhance their uh, efficacy, I think is completely misguided and a dinosaur. Well, you just touched on something that's yeah, that's a different show for a different day. I would love to go down those roads with you too. That's yeah, accountants, uh, there's all kinds of things that yeah. Anyway, next next time, um, Joe Biden. Uh, he is uh, past his time. Donald Trump. I think he is a change agent. I think mm -hmm. that he is someone who is uh, very much uh, a powerful person to be for of influence. And I am hopeful that he stays focused on the ways in which he can be positive as opposed to being negative. I like that. Elon Musk. Someone who needs to focus. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Elon Musk and uh, he's one of the few people on the planet that has the ability to influence the future of humanity. And I hope that he stays focused on what is really important and what he should use his time for, because uh, he's only got so much time on this planet.
as we all do. Yeah, well said. Vitalik Buterin. <laughs> um, an interesting character. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Peter Schiff. Also an interesting character. I think Peter Schiff is somebody who uh, is very successful at um, agitating people and getting engagement. Um, uh, it's bait, uh, bait to get people uh, talking about gold. He's very effective at doing that. I think he's wrong on gold, as I do most people that are supporters of gold. Uh, I could talk for hours about gold uh, and my, why I believe that it is, uh, it is a con. But um, as an investment, I yeah. guess it's an it's a, it's an element, right? We can all agree it's an yeah. element on the periodic table. Um, it has uh, it has atomic properties that are promised to you and nothing else. Yep. Faith. Essential. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important for any human being to, even if they're not a, um, a believer in organized religion, mm -hmm. to understand the power that faith has. Um, even if it's not faith in the sense of believing in a creator, um, which I do, I, I, I think it's important to, to, to have faith in humanity and have faith in human beings to do good in the end, which is what I alluded to earlier in the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, uh, the founding fathers. Flawed human beings, but ultimately those who pushed us forward as, as a race, um, there's people that I think that, uh, should need not be glorified but also people that should be to some extent revered for the sacrifices that they took. Um, just like every generation in the past, uh, from, you know, the common man, the unsung hero, all the way up to the, the presidents and very influential statesmen. I think they left a legacy of something that we enjoy today. And, uh, we should revere the founding fathers, although we shouldn't, we shouldn't make them out to be gods or perfect human beings. They had many flaws. Well said, uh, Bitcoin trading cards. Bitcoin traded cards are cool. Um, I, I, uh, I would love to get my hands on a few packs. I have to do that. I've been, I've seen them on Twitter and I've always been like, I need to just buy a bunch of these cause they're, they're super cool. So, we'll get um, maybe if they're in uh, Tennessee, yeah. uh, for, for, uh, Bitcoin 2024, it, I think, okay, you're nodding your head. Yep. I'll have to, uh, somehow find the booth and, and stock I'll up bring you because over. I think those are cool. And, uh, I, I'd love to have a whole set of, yeah. well, I'll bring you over and we'll, we'll rip some packs. We'll get you some packs and, uh, We'll have some fun with it. Uh, Let's do it. And then uh, lastly, uh, your firm, is it uh, Amund Amundsen Davis? Is that the firm? Amundsen, Amundsen Davis, Amundsen yes. Davis. Yes. Last one. That's the last one. Uh, yeah. So Amundsen Davis is growing rapidly. Uh, we were, we were just last year at this time, we were merging with an entity uh, out of uh, Wisconsin. Wow. So we're, we're now, uh, we added 70 lawyers to the firm. Wow. I think we're getting close to 300. Uh, so we're full service practice group. And what I'm excited about is my, my Bitcoin practice, which, um, knock on wood pretty soon, I think is going to fill up the entirety of my practice. Wow. Uh, it's already the bulk of my cases right now. Congrats. Uh, I think that it would be awesome, uh, to represent, uh, you know, I, I already represent miners from coast to coast, but I would love to expand that work and, and do it almost, uh, uh exclusively, right. That's wow. the dream, right. To do the exclusively work and in Bitcoin, uh, through representing folks that are, that are trying to secure the network. Wow. That is incredible. Congrats on that. And congrats on you. You passed this just like the bar. So great, great work, Joe. <laughs> I appreciate, I know you got harder than the bar. Than the I mean, bar. you asked me about Peter Schiff, man. That's, that's a tough one. Tried to make it, try to make it a little tough. Um, but I appreciate you being a good sport and uh, coming on here. I just, I really appreciate your uh, perspective on things as I know many do. So thank you for coming on being a, a playable character today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And uh, sometime in the future, we do have to have a, a macro discussion. That'll be that we didn't we didn't really touch on it, but I love talking. I know. About you, that. You, I, I took my whole day about law and Bitcoin and regulation and the government and talked to clients about their fears about getting sued and that. that. But I do like talking about about economics. You do. Uh, I, I love it. You so do. Sometimes. Well, you. I know a lot of Bitcoiners see you talk a lot about that, so I figured we'd kind of go the other route a little bit with it because they see you on Twitter. No, you know, no, macro a lot too. So, but next time, next time we'll do gold. I would love for you to talk about gold, AI replacing, or, or just an aiding, you know, the law profession, and um, and then also as a macro. So next time we can for sure do that. Maybe next. Well, it's been a genuine pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. On. Thanks, Joe. Thank you for checking out this episode of the Playable Characters Show, brought to you by Bitcoin Trading Cards. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future Bitcoin and financial experts we have on the show. 
Plus, we will be doing random big giveaways throughout different moments of shows, of collectible cards, sats, merch, and more from guests, so you won't not miss anything. This show does not constitute any investment advice, only freedom advice. Everything you see here is opinions from the host and the guests themselves, nothing further. Please don't trust, verify. For full transparency, I do lead marketing efforts at Bitcoin Trading Cards where we are trying to spread freedom to all of humanity and orange pill the world one collectible physical trading card at a time by making things fun and easy to talk about that normally make you want to cry. You can reach me directly through my email, brandon at btc-cards.com with any inquiries or playable character suggestions. See you on the next one.